So you've already studied the structure and function of DNA. We've talked about protein synthesis um, and how DNA works. But now we're going to look at uh, Mendelian genetics inheritance. It's called Mendelian genetics because it's named after Gregor Mendel, uh, who was the monk turned scientist that pioneered this entire area of biology. Now with inheritance, a lot of it to do is to do with your vocabulary. You need to have all the key terms in order to be able to explain, well, interpret questions and explain your answers fully. This uh, diagram here shows a particular uh, homologous pair of chromosomes. It's just one homologous pair. So one has come from the mother, one has come from the father. And in your cells, you've got 23 pairs just like this. The position of each gene on a chromosome is, no, is known as its locus. Um, that's where it's placed on the chromosome. The same gene will be on the same locus for each of the homologous uh, chromosomes. The genes, um, however, could be different alleles. They can be different versions of the same gene. So they'll code for the same trait, but they could be different versions. This, the combination of those alleles is called the genotype for that individual, and that genotype will go on to code for the particular phenotype of the individual. Now in this case, this person has one of each allele for this gene, and so they are what we call heterozygous, and the genotype would be big A, little a. Um, as big A is dominant over the little a, which is, that's why you have the capital in a small letter, um, then this allele is the one that will be expressed in the phenotype in this case. The big A will be dominant over the little a and be expressed. Uh, the person, it, it look at this gene here, at a different locus, the person is homozygous recessive for this particular trait. So they've got two, that's what, they've got two of the same alleles, that's homozygous, and they're both recessive, so it's homozygous recessive. So their genotype is little t, little t. Sometimes one allele isn't fully dominant over another one, and they can both contribute to the phenotype. And these alleles are what we call co-dominant, something we'll come back to later on. So all these terms um, that you can see on this slide here, you need to know well. Now we're going to work through all the different types of uh, inheritance that you need to know about. First we'll look at when you've just got one gene which codes for one characteristic and how, that is, uh, how they interact um, can be passed on. Then we'll look at two genes um, coding for two separate characteristics. And finally, we'll look at examples where two genes can work together um, to end up coding for one particular characteristic. So, let's start off with the first one. Uh, now, this is what we call a monohybrid cross. This should be revision, it's something you should have done before. This is when a, you, the inheritance of a single gene. So, if we take an example here, an allele for brown is dominant over blue. Blue is recessive. A man is heterozygous for brown eyes, and he uh, reproduces with a woman who is heterozygous for brown eyes also. What percentage of their children will have blue eyes? Now, you must always lay out the genetic, your answers in the same way, um, showing all these levels of detail. Starting with the parent's phenotype, which in this case is both brown and the phenotype, is just uh, what is expressed, what does the actual characteristic look like at the end. So in this case, it's brown, it's crossed with brown. The genotype, they're both heterozygous, so it's big B little b crossed with big B little b. The gamete should be shown in circles, so that father, when he produces his sperm, will be able to pass on either a big B in his sperm or a little b in his sperm. The mother is the same when she produces her eggs, but in meiosis, remember you turn a diploid cell into haploid cells, so these gametes are only going to have one of each allele from the parent. So in this case, the mother can also pass on either a big B or a little b. We put them into what we call a Punnett square, with the fathers on one side and the mothers on the other side, and then just match them up to show the offspring. The F1 genotype, so that's the first generation, um, it's called F1. You've got the genotypes are one times big B, big B, two times big B, little b, and one times little b, little b, and then their phenotypes are that three quarters of them will be brown, and only one uh, quarter, one out of the four, will be blue, which was the uh, uh, little b, little b, because it's homozygous recessive. So that is a standard monohybrid cross that should be revision. Good examples 
um, that may come up in questions on this are to do with genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis and Huntington's, Huntington's disease. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive condition, um, so it's a recessive allele that causes a condition. Um, so you could be a carrier if you're heterozygous, but you'll need to be a homozygous recessive to actually have cystic fibrosis. Uh, or Huntington's disease, which is actually caused by a dominant allele, so it's inherited slightly differently. Uh, now you should know, as I said, that the first level of offspring from the parents is called the F1 generation, and then the next level down is called the F2 generation. Uh, this example, uh, which is a classic example that Mendel did, shows true breeding. When we say true breeding or pure breeding, we mean homozygous. Uh, so uh, we've, got a, we've got true breeding for green, means that it must be homozygous for green, and true breeding for uh, yellow means it must be homozygous dominant. So we've got homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive breeding together. And when you look at the F1 generation, they are all heterozygous. These were then interbred, um, so uh, two of those were selected and bred together and uh, to get the F2 generation, which you can see is given as this three to one ratio again. So when you take two heterozygous individuals and make them together, you always end up with this three to one ratio in this example. You'll need to also be familiar with pedigree diagrams. Pedigree diagrams show us the family history of a genetic condition and you need to know how to interpret one. Why not pause the video now and see if you can work out the genotypes of the individuals labelled 1, 2 and 3. So I hope you used the information in the diagram and the information under the diagram to be able to work out what they were. Here are the answers here. Um, the information about the fact that if you're affected, uh, if it, the, it's shaded in blue, then you must be homozygous recessive. That gives you number one straight off. And therefore, looking at the offspring um, and what they've got, you there, therefore can look at uh, what the other parent must have. Um, and similarly, if you look at uh, number three, they were unaffected um, themselves, so they can't be homozygous recessive. They must be either heterozygous or homozygous dominant. But because they had an affected offspring, again, that tells you what number three should be. Uh, another thing that you should know about is something called a test cross. And this is uh, where you don't always know what the particular uh, parent is. So for example, um, the yellow pea seed could be either um, homozygous dominant, it could be big Y, big Y for yellow, or it could be heterozygous, big Y, little Y. We don't know that just from looking at its phenotype. But if we do a test cross, if we cross it with something that we know the genotype of, which is most easy thing to do is to use homozygous recessive, so a green one in this case, and we look at the offspring that we are produced, we can work out what the parents must have had. So if we do the cross and there are uh, some green individuals, then we know that the original yellow pea that we had must have been heterozygous. But if there aren't any green at all, then we know it was homozygous dominant. So we can use a test cross to work out uh, the genotype of certain uh, unknowns.